with, with that, uh, we're going to get it started here. Uh, Karan Dwivedi with uh, Google. And, and I don't know, I'm a little scared now if I don't want to use my vacuum cleaner, um, but I'm going to I'm going to hope I still want to use it at the end of this talk. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. I know this is the last talk of the day, but I promise I'll keep this short. Um, if I do get audience participation, I have a bunch of swag, um, which I'll talk about of how you can get it during the talk. So I know people are still trickling in, um, but I'm just going to get started and we're going to talk about vacuum bots today. So everybody with me? All right. That's what I need. Cool. All right, so who am I? I am Karan, you can call me K. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Google. Um, I graduated from Carnegie Mellon way back in the time. I don't want to state my age. Um, I write security engineering interviewing articles at my blog, and for fun, I travel and go to the beach. Um, quick disclosure, like I work for Google, but this research is done in my own time, so there is no relation whatsoever um, with them. All right, so what are we looking at today? Um, we're going to see why research vacuum bots. But like before I go into all of this stuff, how many of you here have a vacuum bot or plan to get one? Oh, wow. Okay. How many of us think they are secure? Awesome. I've had, I've had people like a few brave souls raise their hands before the talk and after the talk they were all like, anyway. So we're going to talk about why research vacuum bots. We're going to see the functionality, right, how they actually function. Then I'm going to show you a technique of how you can conduct network forensics by your own, at your own home, right. Um, we'll walk through some security and privacy concerns. Now, the next final part is the most interesting one. I'll walk you through how I reported issues with a vendor and their response. And finally, I'll take time for q and I think we're allocated about 10 minutes at the end. Uh, so please hold off your questions and then we can answer them one by one. All right? All right, cool. The real agenda is about swag. <laughs> so. As, as I said, uh, I have some nice Titan security keys with me, which I'll be giving out during the course of this talk, um, as long as I get the right answers from all of you. Yes, okay. So let's jump in. Uh, why research vacuum bots? So it's very simple, right? If you look at the market that's uh, going on from 2016 and future projections, it's very clear that from this graph, thank you, Grandview Research, Every year, the vacuum bot industry is going by 17% given the number of millions of units sold. Think about that for a second. They are there literally everywhere. Right? The market itself, in terms of revenue, is growing by 23% every year. By 2027, there's going to be 60.9 million of these bots around us. If you look at the top major players in this industry, right, there are a few, I've listed them down on the left, but what I want you to take away from this slide is the right hand side, right? Notice that it's not dominated by any particular vendor, right? But it's also not fragmented. So it's kind of in the middle and that's very interesting from a security point of view because you can have a lot of issues from one vendor but none of them from the other. Right? All right. So let's jump into some functionality, right? I'm going to go a little bit quick, but I want to preserve time at the end for the most interesting stuff. All right? So bots have different functionalities, right? They can be cleaning modes, like you can just say, hey bot, go clean my house. That's an auto mode. It's going to do its job, right? Hopefully. Um, if you say edges, it's going to go around the room. So like in this room, for example, Edges would mean going all around this room, right? The rectangle that we are in. The spot cleaning is just like, oh, here's a dirty spot, clean it for me. And then manual is like, you direct it step by step, right? And say, go left, go right, go front, go back. Um, what's interesting is you can even set these bots to run on a schedule. So, for example, 
for somebody like me who doesn't want to get up in the morning, I can say, hey, bot, clean my house at 6 a.m., let me sleep, right? So you can set that up. <clears throat> and finally, you can also monitor some of the health uh, of accessories. So I want to know when do I replace the brushes on my bot, and my bot can tell me that. That's cool, right? Some bots also come up with uh, functionality like floor mapping, right? So let's say you leave a bot here, it's going to figure out how this room looks like. That's called floor mapping. Um, it can also figure out if you have more than one floors. So for example, you have you know, the first floor and then you have the second floor of the house. Depending on where the bot is, it can intelligently figure out which floor it is at. So some bots have this feature, not every bot has this feature. So I just found that in my research. And finally, in, in a few bots, there's also live video. Honestly, that scared the shit out of me. When I saw that, I'm like, uh-uh-uh. So with that understanding, let's go into how you can set up a bot, right? And this is a generic example, right? I'm just going to go through a general process. It's not true for everything, but it's true for most things. So let's focus on the diagram on the, on the figure here, right? In the black box, you see, that's the home network. So I have the phone, which is, you know, any smartphone you have, just like I have here. I have a cable modem in my apartment to talk outside to the internet, and then I have a bot at the bottom, right? In the home network, when I just get a bot from, you know, I just buy the bot and I get it in my apartment, I would install the app on the phone, right? Every manufacturer has an app that you can install, create an account, the very basic process, right? When you do that, it's going to create an account on the manufacturer's website, right? That step the first two steps. The next thing that's going to happen is the app is going to search for a bot near the phone, right? So it's going to say, hey, any bot nearby, right? It's interesting because these bots are configured to create a Wi-Fi network, right? a temporary local Wi-Fi network. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, oh, I'm here, join this network. And once you join that network, all it's going to do is share your home's Wi-Fi credentials with the bot. So this is just a way of sharing the username, actually the, the password for your home connection, right? And once the bots get that, they're going to associate the bot to your account. Is everybody with me so far? Cool. Awesome. So now that we have an understanding of the bot, how to set them up, Let's talk about how all of you can set up your own home network for cheap. So I literally took a screenshot, actually sort of, sorry, a photo of my own apartment when I did this to prove that I actually did this. Um, and I have three components to it, right? Three major network components. One is a router on the left. The one is a switch in the middle. And then there's a cable modem at the right, right? I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to give out a Titan key. What do you guys think is the cost of this network equipment, including cables, approximately? Just shout out numbers. Seventy-five dollars. Who? Four hundred? Four fifty? One ninety-five hundred. Three fifty. Five hundred. The last one. Too many. Too many. Let's let's go one at a time. 50. Who's, who, was, who was closest to... Oh, sorry, I'll take one last one. 125. It's actually 150 bucks. So you're the closest. I'm going to give you that. <laughs> sorry, it's hard to hear everybody in this room. I apologize. Yeah, so... Approximately 150 bucks, right? Um, I didn't include the cost of the devices I had, but it's not very expensive to set this up. All right, now let's look at the same figure, how it looks like, you know, in, an, in this icon form, just to make things very simple. Because here the cables are super messy, right? You cannot tell what's connected to what. So <clears throat> let's look, look at this from left to right, okay? So the bot talks to the internal Wi-Fi network. 
okay, which talks to the switch, which forwards back it to my cable modem, which then talks to the external world. So from left to right is a communication from the bot to the external world, all right? And the same connection goes back. So if the bot gets a response, it's gonna come back to the cable modem, to the mirror port, to, sorry, to the, to the switch, to the router, to the bot, all right? To look at all the traffic going and coming from the bot, I have a mirror port on the switch. So I can see everything that the bot sees, right? And I've connected a machine with running a cap packet capture, right? So I can see everything that's going across. Notice one thing. The app is talking directly to the cable modem's Wi-Fi, not to the internal Wi-Fi. And that's because I don't want to see the phone's traffic yet, right? So I can segregate the networks. Does it make sense? All right. So with that setup and with the understanding of bots, let's look at how you all can conduct forensics. So what I did was I, you know, I bought a bunch of bots, right? And for every setup and every step that these bots can do for me, like for example, the setting up that we talked about, the move example, the clean example, the live video example, I did all of that for bots and I packet captured everything, right? That's the methodology I followed. And then I took those packet captures and sat down for hours and analyzed them. It's pretty boring work, but that's what I did. So let's look at an example of how this looks like on the network, right? So on the network, I know it's a little bit small, so what I did, I wrote stuff down and I'm gonna talk you guys through this. So basically, the first thing I found when a bot talks outside from your home is a very simple DNS request, right? In most cases, these bots are talking outside to a cloud provider, right? So basically, my home is configured to use 8.8.8, .8 which is Google's DNS. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the response I get is the cloud provider's IP, right? So this is obvious step one, right? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What? You unfortunately have brought this on yourself. Yes. <laughs> uh, you've reached the outrageous speaker request portion of the evening. Our fine friend here has told me that he didn't realize that these things were cool and that uh, he was hoping that I would do one for him. And I said, well, do one what? And he says, well, I don't know. I like root beer. So I said, okay. What we have here is two bottles of root beer, chilled, delicious, high quality. However, one of these bottles has been shaken and the other has not. You're gonna join me here at the chair. Okay. The game begins when I put these on the table. What? This is my new Mac. No, no, bro. over here, <laughs> over here, over here. That's why we got the chair. The game begins when I put them down between us. Then you will choose and we will both pick up our bottle and open it and we find out who wins and who loses. Are we gonna do it there? All right, thank you for the surprise. I just asked for a root beer and I get to play this game, so. <laughs> it's awesome. All right, so was everybody, did everybody lost track of where I was? I did. Anyway, um, yeah, we looked at the first DNS request. Um, so the IP that's returned is for the cloud provider, right? That's the first step. After this, because the packets are really like big, as you can see, 
I, I captured the essence of the traffic from the following slides. So what I observed is when you press move, right, let's say you say turn right, right, what happens is I see the following text being exchanged on the network, right? So the server to bot says, hey bot, move, turn right. And the turn right is actually in XMPP. Does everybody see XMPP here? See heads nodding? Yeah. So you see the move and spin right as the action. That's what I see on the network. Pretty straightforward, right? But then the bot also goes back to the server and says, result 85. I think that 85 is the, is the ID of the request, right? So that's a very, very simple example that I saw on the, on the capture. Similarly, when you say, oh, clean the house, right? So it's, it says, okay, I have the auto setting on, I'll clean it with a speed of strong. This is the extra data I really like to see. Um, and then it finally says, okay, I cleaned it, the clean report is that, right? So exchange of packets. I also saw keep alive. So this is something I didn't really think about, but then it really made sense to me, right? So if your bot is, is connected to your home network and it's not running, it's not doing anything, it may still communicate out and say, I'm still here. Make sense. Let's talk about authentication because we never talked about, this is a security conference, so what are we doing, right? Um, there are two ways of authentication that I found, right? One was SASL. Um, SASL can be used with, you know, a number of protocols. But in this case, I actually saw plain text passwords. We'll talk about vendor stuff after this, so we'll see how that goes. And then the bot says, success. All right. Fortunately, not all bots are like that. Some bots actually say, hey, I'm going to use MQTT. MQTT is for IoT devices, for those who you may not know. But it's secure, so it can use like uh, 8 port 8883 and it can communicate out from that port, and it does not use plain text. So while that's a relief, I was eh, <laughs> not really happy. And finally, <clears throat> I also saw something very interesting when I did not do anything. So when I, when I have a phone, right, and I open the app on the phone, as soon as I open the app, I saw these packets, I saw this data. And I'll walk you through what that is, right? So as soon as I open the app, I see a request called set time. And I see the time, those numbers, 16515, right? That's an epoch time. So time since 1970s, January 1st, right? In seconds. And it says TZ time zone, I assume, minus seven. Basically what's happening is the bot is getting the time from my phone because I was in California at the time, so time zone makes sense to me. Um, and it's setting its own time as my phone's time. Anybody see issues with that? People are nodding their heads. You can tell where somebody is, exactly. I think that's what you were saying. Thank you, yes. And we'll get to that uh, later. All right, so I guess people must have figured out the issues, but I'm gonna walk through them and show you the interesting parts. So can somebody control our bots? Can somebody hijack them, right? And there are two ways of looking at this. One, your local network, right? Can somebody be in your home, a friend walks in and is like, hey, I wanna use your Wi-Fi, cool, and starts monitoring your packets. Yeah, can happen. Um, and the second one is remote attackers, right? Can somebody just external you don't know, can they hijack the bot? Well, if somebody is local, then yes, they can replay commands, right? If there's no such nonce, if there's no such identifier that's unique, they can do replay and it will work. For, for remote, that's not very easy to do, right? The easiest way for a remote attacker to get control of your bot is to just attack your credentials. Figure out a way to get your credentials and they're in. And as I kind of expected, there is no two-factor auth. None whatsoever. What about floor plans? So we remember the bots can scan your home, right? All the floors, if you want them to. 
the the way these bots store that data is either on the app so locally on your phone or in the cloud right again like it's it's a part of the app so it's data on your phone so if your phone is vulnerable yes you can get that but app credentials are again the easiest to get through that right and by the way this app does not need to be attacked by its own. You can have other vulnerabilities on your phone that can compromise the app, so your floor plan can be leaked, right? So there's so many ways that your floor plan can be leaked, not just because of a particular app. In the research I did, I did not explicitly discover that this was being leaked. Like, for example, I did not see any packets, but that doesn't mean it's not a possibility, right? Somebody rightly mentioned, actually two people, course location, right? And this is, this is very spot on. As the user moves around, the bot will say, oh, I am this time zone. And ac I actually discovered this accidentally. I was, I think I was messing with my time because I was traveling, I don't remember. But as soon as the time changed on my phone, the bot had a really messy schedule of cleaning and I'm like, something is wrong. And I figured out that it was this, this was the case, right? So the time zone had changed on my phone. The bot thought, oh, it's like 9 a.m. Pacific when it's really like 6 a.m. or 12 p.m., right? So it really messed up the schedule. Everybody with me so far? All right, awesome. I have two more swags to give, so. <clears throat> Let's talk about video recordings, right? Here I tried to show you people how it looks like on the network, right? I know the text is very small because Wireshark, but if you see on the right, there is some metadata that you can capture just by looking at the traffic. So thankfully, I don't see video itself, like I don't see any video encodings being passed around, but I do see metadata involving that recording. So for example, it can say, oh, start streaming at this time, right? So I can figure out when the live video was started, stuff like that. As you can see on the left, um, there's UDP traffic, so pretty obvious, right? It's, it's video. Um, but yeah, nothing very sensitive. <clears throat> all right, the fun part begins. So I took all these findings, so it took me a few months to figure this out, and I wrote a really long email to the vendor. And to prove that I did, I took screenshots. So you don't have to read this. I already described all of these issues to you, all of you. But I just did to show you the dates and my name. So notice the dates. So right now the first email or first notification was November 18th, 2019. Right? I know it's a bit small, but I'll say it out loud. November 1819, first report, right? I say, hey, report of these issues, blah, 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 and a big detailed email on how I found them. All right? I went on to describe more issues, so I said, okay using insecure protocols, XMPP, potential man in the middle, right? Host location tracking, I go on and on and on. I don't know who read that email, sorry. Um, and then finally, like privacy of floor plans. So I wrote all of this and I said, help, please fix this. All right, can anybody guess what happened next? I'll take one by one, I know a lot of hands. I'll start from here. Can you please be can you please be a little bit louder? They sent the lawyers. They send the lawyers. Oh god, I'm still here. But yes, that's a good guess. I'm sorry. It's not a bug, it's a feature. Thank you. Amazing reply. Nothing. Nothing. Good one. Sorry, let's do it on the front. Automated response, exactly. So they said, they said, oh, hello. We love to hear what you think of our service. <laughs> and they asked me to rate the response. Somebody said no response, that was close, but I still got a response. So she's more accurate. Thank you. All right, so particularly happy after putting all these hours and stuff so I followed up and said hey like this is not done I need something back can you please take a look so that's the reply I sent back I basically said you know responsible disclosure you have 90 days right I can go out in the public and talk about this but I'm not gonna do it 
because I care. So, you know, please take a look. December 17th, after almost a month, I heard back a response, right? And the parts I want everybody to read are the one in red. It basically says, we have implemented XMPP, which is an older model, okay. All our new models use secure technology to ensure user security. Does that mean the older models do not ensure security? I don't know. So I followed up again and I said, hey, this is not done, right? February 19. So we are now from November to February, right? They said, thank you for your concern. We appreciate the feedback. I'm passing these notes to the application team, you know, all of that. So I said, okay, I'll wait. I still didn't disclose. March 30th. I said, hey, it's been a long time. Can you assign a CVE or CWE, something to give me credit? Um, please do not delay this matter any further. There are millions of these bots out there. Thank you for your prompt response. <sighs> okay. After seven months, July 28th, right? So from November to July, I finally got this response, which says, thank you for writing. I mean, they've thanked me three times. I, I don't think I want that. And then they said, we have escalated your concerns to the related department. What department? One final guess. What happened next? I'm going to take five people just to save time. Start right from the back, the blue gentleman, please. Yes. They just closed it and? They closed it. They didn't disclose it. I disclosed it. Oh, okay, I'm, that's what I'm doing here now. <laughs> so bribe me. So the response was they offered me a new model to not disclose it. Well, I, it didn't happen and I'm still talking about this. Three more people. Um, gentlemen here. They closed it? They ghosted. Exactly. Yep, so even today I don't have a response. However, the newer models seem to be more secure. And I wonder why. In conclusion, if you think about these IoT devices, they're all over the place, right? They use insecure protocols. It's very challenging to get a response. Like, look, I understand that you want to ship to the market, right, there's competition, but it's very hard to balance security and privacy, right? That's where I was coming from. And out of this talk, if you don't take anything, just take that, you know, you cannot trust any device right away, right? Figure out a way to research this on your own. That's the real takeaway. And you can do this for really cheap cost, right? You don't have to spend a lot of money. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now, but thanks for keeping it clean. I think I ended like 30 minutes early, so. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is, did I reach out on Twitter and tag them? Uh, that's a good idea. I just didn't want to take anything publicly, so I did not. I just wanted to document everything in writing, but maybe in the future I will. Yes, I'll take all questions now. I'm not selecting people, so yes. So the question is, did they issue a CV or not? No, they did not issue anything. There's, there's no public disclosure or vulnerability around this. But yeah, uh, people can use the mic, so I don't have to like come back. If you guys don't mind using the mic, that'd be awesome. Uh, uh, yeah. So just from a purely pragmatic perspective of someone who wants a robotic vacuum but hasn't gotten one yet because of all the privacy issues, and I don't really care whether it violates my... Pri 
privacy securely or not. Are you aware of any other any other research or any research you've done yourself into like modifying them just purely for pri personal privacy or any that are better on that or anything like that? So sorry, your voice was, a, voice was a bit muffled, but I think I understand your question. You said, are there any other security privacy research around this on other bots and overall? R right, specifically yeah. just to a purely pragmatic perspective right. of like modifying one or which one to buy from a yeah. perspective of just enhancing personal privacy yes. while using one. Yes, so we have a conference this week called DEF CON. And uh, if you look at previous talks of DEF CON, there is actually, I think, one or two talks that break down a particular vendor and talk about it. So I can share the links later, but there are existing work on this. Yes? Hey, uh, thank you very much for this talk, by the way. I really appreciate it. This is really eye-opening. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is, do you suppose, do you know what maybe hardware they used inside the bot? Because I, I know like ESP, like 8832s or whatever, I mean, they support SSL. Right. They're like a dollar, and I just don't understand. Like, you can get, you can go out and get the certificates. You can validate the cert chain. Yeah. I just don't. It just seems like even like do, one dollar microcontrollers can do this. Like, what's the point? I don't really see the time to market. The TCP stack is built into the ESPs. I believe it is. At right. least I've done ESP, and I never had to do anything TCP. It was just there. Yeah. I just don't understand like what they're missing. I've done SASL on XMPP, but it was encrypted. Right. Like, I, I wasn't on a vacuum bot, but I just don't understand. Like, do you have any idea, like, why, when it's a dollar, to just get this yeah. amount, just lock a thing, lock the thing out, put SSL on it, get the full cert chain? Like, what are they? What are they gaining by this? Like, I, I just don't understand. I, Ten years from now, the bot might not work because a new CA came out or something like that. I anyway, I'm just curious if you have any ideas on that. Oh. No, excellent point. Right, as you said, it's not very expensive to build in security. And by the way, this is a bot I tested in 2019. So I'm sure it was released a year or two ago. So we are talking 2017 timeframe, maybe. Um, at that time, maybe there was a prioritization decision. I honestly do not know the answer, but I'm gonna make some educated guesses, right? Maybe there's a competition to ship products. Maybe there is something that they want to prioritize as a feature, but not as security. Maybe they said, okay, a password is good enough, we don't really care about like the technology so much. It's working, let's ship and let's reiterate on this. Um, one of the other reasons I've seen is they have improved security iteratively. So the newer models, as I said, are better, right? So maybe that was a backlog. I don't really know. I'm gonna guess those were some factors, if that makes sense. Yes. Did you, uh, can, am I muffled? Can you hear me? Sorry, I can't, I have a hard okay. time hearing you. I was gonna say, am I muffled? Can you hear me? Um, did you try any like, so one of the interesting things is that I've found similar vulnerabilities in devices like I, with network attached devices and when I made the disclosure, I explained that you can use the stun protocol in a web browser to be able to detect these devices within the network right. and then send packets from them within the network without having to be physically there. Did right. you investigate those kind of things? Because it looks to me as though you might be able to do a cross protocol attack from a web browser onto the the Roomba-like device itself without yes. having to physically be in the network. And their primary defense was like, oh, you have to be physically in the network to do this, yeah. which I disagree with. Yes, so th that's a great point. So there are some bots for which there's emulators written out, if you can find them on GitHub, right? And you can say, oh, like, I don't need a bot. I can emulate the bot. And you could do it on your local network right away. And the moment you do that, that means that you can send commands to a real bot by capturing how the emulator works. So you mentioned stun, yeah, in this case I didn't observe stun, but like that's an example that you so can use. I wasn't saying that the bot itself was talking stun, but you can use a, a couple of different web APIs to be able yeah. to discover the IP address of these web, or it's not actually a web protocol, but it's a protocol that is plain text, so you can send it over a web browser. Okay. Then you can, when a, a victim loads a web page, you can get the web page to send requests to the robot by using these APIs to discover its IP address. And that yeah. would allow you to bypass the whole, like, you have to be physically in the network restriction. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. I, I, so for my research, the scope was network and not, I didn't go to the web browser and send yeah. APIs. Hey, that can be a follow-up research on top of this. Yeah. You can Go definitely to. send XML structures yeah. over the network to devices. Yeah. Exactly. Hello, uh, great talk, by the way. Um, I was wondering, in regards to the, the robot having its own Wi-Fi, uh, when, you, when you initially set it up, is this something that is always exposed? And, and do you know if there's anything more you can do with that to uh, trick it into taking commands or so? 
Yeah, so I I didn't dig deep into that specific SSID because it's like temporary. They just if you press a button on it, that's when it pops up. Okay. But I I will be hesitant to say that they will accept commands because the bot is not set up yet. The bot is not registered with an account yet. Like it's not associated. So I'm gonna guess no. Yeah. But given this, I don't know. There might be some new ones that they have not really you know tracked that really well. So. And one more was: uh, sure. Have you have you heard about the incidents where there are just people sending out cleaning commands to their neighbors and stuff and messing around with their bots? I have not. I mean, given Shodan and all, everything around us, <laughs> you you can re re write a talk and deliver it right here. That'd be awesome. All right, thank you. Yeah. So uh, my question is: uh, Did you test the same? Did you see the same packet uh, pattern in the new updated version? I did not. So they started using SSL. That was good. So I did buy some recent bots. I'm not going to name them, but I could not see anything on the network. And I was very happy with that for some reason. And did you saw those pattern in one specific vendor or the previous one? In one specific vendor or, okay, I'm not going to ask like specific, or you saw it in multiple vendors, the same so, pattern? Yeah, uh, yeah. So this was one particular one, but I did test several of them, and I think in the last two or three years, most are using SSL. So you will not see most things on the network, and that's why I'm actually able to give this talk because it's over now. Thank yes. you. Yep. Thank you. So you mentioned that it's more secure. Uh, the newer iterations of their products tend to be more secure, and I just heard that there's SSL. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's a if there's still aspects that you want to investigate on these newer devices that you think is probably still an active area of concern, um, it seems to me like the provisioning one where you know there's that step that you're sending maybe credentials over an open temporary network created yeah. by the device yeah. that it would be a good opportunity to s sniff and yes. get a password to yeah. somebody's home network. But uh, I, I mean, I just want to hear what other things you think there may be to look at on these newer devices that you think are, at least for now, more secure. Yeah, yeah I mean, great question, right? This is basically asking how you can extend this research. Mm -hmm. um, couple of things, right? Look for PIN certificates. Look for self-signed certificates. See if you can break SSL. That mm -hmm. would be awesome. Not so much for <laughs> users, but for improving security. I should be careful. This is being recorded. Um, and then um, I think other things include like, because there's always new manufacturers coming out, right? We saw the market. It's, it's not like super fragmented, but there's every time there's new ones on Amazon and, and Best Buy. Pick one and see what you can see. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. So you touched on this a bit during the QA process. Sorry. Can you be a little bit louder, please? You touched on this a bit during the QA process right now. And you mentioned that there were a couple of the other ones that you tested. Yes. Um, but specifically the device that was presented here, was that one tested because you had it and so you tested it or that was the worst of the bunch? Do you still have it operating in your house or did you take that one and shut it down and use something that was more secure? I feel like I'm Why being social engineered one? here. <laughs> I first have to get on your network, so. Yes, so apparently it was given to me by somebody. I did not go and buy it. And I was like, oh, I want to see what's happening on the network. And then I found this and I'm like, huh, I should research this more. It's not on my network anymore, if that's what you're asking. I think the other guy social engineered you, but yeah. in, in short, you, you tested that one specifically just because you had it. It wasn't, you yeah. didn't target that one or test five yeah. or six, okay. Yeah, it was out of curiosity, yes. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for talk. Uh, two questions. The first one is like, uh, from what I could see, the bot, uh, use a password to authenticate to the service. Was that your password or do they all use the same one? <laughs> Excellent question. So I think it's a combination of, well, they use the password I provided in for the app, but it's not directly that password. It's like it's encoded and then it's padded with something. So yeah, you can figure out what, he, what it is just by looking at that. Okay. Yeah. The second one is, I think I heard seven months you waited. Why didn't you do, just go public? It was seven months away. How did I? I think I heard you waited once at one point seven months uh, for reply. Why didn't you just go public sooner? Like why didn't I give this talk sooner? Or just write something up on the internet and then giving a talk? Uh, yeah. Like, I'm impressed with your patience. <laughs> I guess of what I'm saying. 
Yeah, so actually, so I wanted to be a little bit patient with them being able to fix it. I gave them more time on purpose. Um, I actually wanted a CVE right away. That was my push. As long as they have a CVE, like my intentions are good, right? Like it's publicly disclosed. Um, I think there was no CFPs at the time. I don't know, maybe I should find a conference to talk earlier. <laughs> but I just waited just to make sure that I have my basis covered, I get approval from where I work to talk about this. There was a lot going on at the back end for me to become comfortable talking about this. Mm. Now I have all the approvals, so I was like, sure. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. One more question because I think this would be kind of funny. What do you think about the prospects of putting a bot on a bot? A botnet, if you figure oh, out how. A bot on a bot. Yeah, because I, assuming that this is their practice in terms of making these devices, yeah. how easy is it, you think, to maybe find an overflow or some other thing, inject some, some kind of pay program? Execute a bot. I would be very scared <laughs> by that by that idea, um, but I give it a shot. Uh, yeah, that would be cool to see. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. So should I just clean on my own, or should I buy a iRobot? What's your advice? I, it seems like a rigged question. <laughs> I think the general advice is don't buy the most cheapest ones, I guess, in general, because by default, the cost is a significant amount of investment that goes into building the bot, and they may not be invested so much into security, right? So that's general advice, but it doesn't mean that every low-cost bot is not secure, right? If you buy high-end ones, most likely fine, generally okay. <laughs> All right, no further questions. Thank you.